Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these words of life that give us light, light to be shared with others through a living witness. Pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would attend, attend us as we gather together to think upon these things and to that the Holy Spirit would help us to live them, that we might be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. I wasn't, wasn't uh, sure what to share today. Uh, we just prayed, and Steps to Christ is such a such a well-known book, but sometimes old truths become new to us. And these ones of these ones I'm sharing have become new to me in my life, and I pray that it will be the experience of all. God is the source of life and light and joy to the universe. Like rays of light from the sun, like streams of water bursting from a living spring, blessings flow out from him to all his creatures. And wherever the life of God is, is in the hearts of men, it will flow out to others in love and blessing. Our Savior's joy was in the uplifting and redemption of fallen men. For this he counted not his life dear unto himself, but endured the cross, despising the shame. So angels are ever engaging and working for the happiness of others. This is their joy. That which selfish hearts would regard as humiliating service, ministering to those who are wretched and in every way inferior in character and rank, this is the work of sinless angels. The Spirit of Christ self-sacrificing love is a spirit that pervades heaven and is the very essence of its bliss. This is a spirit that Christ's followers will possess, the work that they will do. That line, that which selfish hearts would regard as humiliating service, ministering to those who are wretched, wretched, and in every way inferior in character and rank, it's the work of sinless angels. I met a guy who's walking one, t- one day, on, on a corner in town here. And he's one of the guys that, you know, he's a young guy, addicted to fentanyl, leaning over. When he was walking, they walked so steeped over. And anyway, when we met at the corner, he lifted up his head and I smiled and said hello and asked how he was doing. And he shared that he was just coming from a, from a counseling session that he wants to get off of the drugs. And I encouraged him. You know, but he can do it. I and I share with him, you know, I've I know your experience. And that if I could get better, he could too. And I gave him a copy of Steps to Christ and he, he cherished it. He said, I'm gonna read this tonight. And I offered to pray with him. We prayed right there on that corner. People would stop the stop sign and we I knew they were looking like, why is that guy talking to that guy? And so on. But for me, when I walked away from, from that divine appointment, it brought such joy to me to share with someone who was so downtrodden and to offer them a word of hope and encouragement. Oh, man. And the love of Christ is I'd enshrined like in the heart like sweet fragrance. It cannot be hidden. Its holy influence will be felt by all with whom we come in contact. The spirit of Christ in the heart is like a spring in the desert, flowing to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. Love to Jesus will be manifested in a desire to work as he worked for the blessing and uplifting of humanity that will lead to love, tenderness, and sympathy toward all the creatures that were heavenly father's care. The Savior's life on earth was not a life of ease and devotion to himself, but he toiled with persistent, earnest, untiring effort for the salvation of lost mankind. From the manger to Calvary, he followed the path of self-denial and sought not to be released from arduous tasks, painful travels, and exhausting care and labor. He said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life 
the ramps and from in Matthew 20, verse 28. This was the one great object of his life. Everything else was secondary and subservient. It was his meat and drink to do the will of God and to finish his work. Self and self-interest had no part in his labor. Those who are the partakers of the grace of Christ will be ready to make any sacrifice, but others for whom he died may share the heavenly gift. They will do all they can to make the world better, to their stay in it. This spirit is a sure outgrowth of a soul truly converted. No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. This reminds me of my first, my conversion, my initial conversion. Man, I couldn't talk about it. I, I could, but I carried this little Bible with me everywhere, everywhere in high school and underlined it and eventually had to duct tape the cover together. And my friends, you know, they saw this and, and I, I just wanted to talk about, about God all the time. I couldn't talk. It's like you couldn't shut me up. And one day I remember them playing a trick on me, you know, I, left it somewhere and went back to get it. You know, I just, whatever, I left my book somewhere and I left left my Bible with it. And they hid my Bible on me. And <laughs> they had a lot of fun watching me frantically searching for it. I just couldn't lose it. I still have that Bible you know, 50 years later. So it's been quite precious to me. And it was my first one. Some, someone gave it to me in the street ministry, actually. Couldn't shut me up. If we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit, we shall not be able to hold our peace. This reminds me uh, um, of my disfellowship. You know, I had I had this new light, this truth that was precious to me, and I I just couldn't be quiet about it. I would I would not have been disfellowshed if they asked me, will you promise to be quiet about this? And I, and I said, I, I can't. You know, I'm, I just can't. And uh, of course, they voted to disfellowship me because of that. And later, uh, you know, another friend, they asked him the same thing. And he said, well, I, you know, I won't talk about it. Unless, but if someone asks me, I will. And that was good enough for them, for the truth. For myself, I just, I'm not going to promise to be quiet about something that, that is so exciting. And it's, it's light. And how can you ask me to not talk about it? It's because they couldn't see light in it. I couldn't hold my peace. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we shall have something to tell. Like Philip, when he found the Savior. We shall invite others into his presence. We shall seek to present to them the attractions of Christ and the unseen realities of the world to come. There will be an intensity of desire to follow in the path of Jesus trod. There will be an earnest longing that those around us may behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. John 1 verse 29. And the effort to bless others will react in blessings upon ourselves. Note also that this is true of the effort to curse others will react in curses on ourselves. But when we are of a critical spirit, a critical mind, that we're really harming ourselves. The effort to bless others will react in blessings upon ourselves. This was the purpose of God in giving us a part to act in the plan of redemption. He has granted them the privilege of becoming partakers of the divine nature and, in their turn, of diffusing blessings to their fellow men. This is the highest honor, the greatest joy, that it is possible for God to bestow upon them. Those who thus become participants in labors of love are brought nearest to their creator. 
God might have committed the message of the gospel and all the work of loving ministry to heavenly angels. He might have employed other means for accomplishing his purpose. But in his infinite love, he chose to make us co-workers with himself. With Christ and the angels, that must be. But in his infinite love, he chose to make us co-workers with himself, with Christ and the angels, that we might share the blessing, the joy, the spiritual uplifting, which results from this unselfish ministry. We are brought into sympathy with Christ through the fellowship of his sufferings. Every act of self-sacrifice for the good of others strengthens the spirit of beneficence in the giver's heart. Allying him with, allying him more closely to the Redeemer of the world, who was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Second Corinthians 8, verse 9. It is only as we thus fulfill the divine purpose in our creation that life can be a blessing to us. The divine purpose in our creation to share with others. Life can be a blessing to us. If you will go to work as Christ designs that his disciples shall and win souls for him, you will feel the need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge in the divine things and will hunger and thirst after righteousness. In the Beatitudes, we're told that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, that, that we will be filled. And how is that to happen? It's to feel a need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge of in divine things. We feel I feel that need when I'm when I'm trying to share with others, you know, when there's whatever roadblocks, resistance. The deeper experience and a greater knowledge of divine things causes me, or to hunger for that, causes me to hunger for that and to thirst after it. To, you will plead with God and your faith will be strengthened and your soul will drink deeper drafts at the well of salvation. Encountering opposition and trials will drive you to the Bible and to prayer. You will grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ and will develop a rich experience. The spirit of unselfish labor for others gives depth, stability, and Christ-like loveliness to the character and brings peace and happiness to its possessors. Possessor. The aspirations are elevated. There is no room for sloth or selfishness. <clears throat> Those who thus exercise the Christian graces will grow and will become strong to work for God. They will have clear spiritual perceptions, a steady, growing faith, and an increased power in prayer. The Spirit of God, moving upon their spirit, calls forth the sacred harmonies of the soul in answer to the divine touch. I think of uh, sacred harmonies of the soul. It's like music. And music has harmony, and the notes all play together. And when God's Spirit touches us in answer to our pleading for a deeper experience and knowledge, that's when we have these things happen in our life. Those who thus devote themselves to unselfish effort for the good of others are most surely working out their own salvation. And that that phrase as well has had a little bit of you know um, not a depth of understanding of that and just reading this even just today I, I I realize the explanation how we work out our own salvation it's, it's working for others not for ourselves the only way to grow in grace 
is to be disinterested in doing the very work which Christ has enjoined upon us to engage to the extent of our ability in helping and blessing those who need the help we can give them. Strength comes by exercise. Activity is a very condition of life. Those who endeavor to maintain Christian life by passively accepting the blessings that come through the means of grace and doing nothing for Christ are simply trying to live by eating without working. And in the spiritual, as in the natural world, this always results in regeneration and decay. A man who would refuse to exercise his limbs would soon lose all power to use them. Thus, the Christian who will not exercise his God-given powers not only fails to grow up into Christ, but he loses the strength that he already has. The Church of Christ is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. Its mission is to carry the gospel to the world, and the obligation rests upon all Christians, everyone, to the extent of his talent and opportunity, is to fulfill the Savior's commission. The love of Christ revealed to us makes us debtors to all who know him not. God has given us light, not for ourselves alone, but to shed upon them. If the followers of Christ were awake to duty, there would be thousands where there is one today proclaiming the gospel in heathen lands, and all who could not personally engage in the work would yet sustain it with their means, their sympathy, and their prayers, and I might say especially their prayers. There would be far more earnest labor for souls in Christian countries Interesting. There would be far more earnest labor for souls in Christian countries. We need not go to heathen lands or even leave the narrow circle of the home if it, if it is there that our duty lies in order to work for Christ. We can do this in the home circle, in the church, among those with whom we associate and with whom we do business. I relate a story about the one with whom we do business when I bought a business near the end of my working career. I bought it from from a friend who I knew from high school and at a Seventh-day Adventist school. We kept in contact over the years, and I worked for him for a little while, and then he wanted to get out of it and have time for other things. But he was a pastor previous to that, and the conference let him go because he wouldn't stay quiet about the problems in the church not to point them out and be judgmental, but to uh, kind of wake the church up to these problems and work to correct them. Anyway, he ended up being fired and dismissed without his pension. And it, it was really a cruel thing that the conference did to him. And, and his wife suffered as well a lot. You know, lost her uh, sense of support and, and also the way the church treated her husband really disappointed her. Now, they didn't leave the church. He continued to minister, uh, volunteering to do sermons and so on, wherever uh, the smaller congregations were, where pastors often have three or four churches and visit them once a month if they have time, when they have time. But he, he continued to minister. He, he continued to give lots of his money that he earned from the business to mission missions and in the business when i bought the business he was careful not to uh, he didn't because he needed the money so much to pay for the business one when he bought it and also you know to give he didn't want to lose even one customer and so he was careful to keep separate his faith expressions of his faith other than by being a kind person and giving good quality customer service he, he didn't share the gospel in words and uh, when I took it over and I was doing that and you know, sharing the book Steps to Christ buying them by the by the case even, and not hesitating to share it with any customer he said I wish I would have done that so 
not to not to say that I'm anything more than, but I didn't didn't count the business and money more important than sharing God with people. And it actually turned out to be quite it, it increased the business somehow because God opened those doors so that could happen. And it it also closed some. And when it did, I just trusted God that that uh, it wasn't the place and time for that to happen there. I even had one customer come rushing out when I went to the truck to get a, get the uh, invoice book. He went out to the truck and he came rushing to the door to meet me. And he said, these people don't share anything with them. He knew I was going to. <laughs> so don't share anything with them because they'll be offended. And I respected that. But he knew. And he, said, he says to me, no, we including himself, like to share God with people, but just don't do it with these people. I know how they will react. And uh, I did. I respected those boundaries. To the paragraph, we can do this in the home circle, in the church, among those with whom we associate, and with whom we do business. The greater part of our Savior's life on earth was spent in patient toil in the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. Ministering angels attended the Lord of life as he walked side by side with peasants and laborers, laborers, unrecognized and unhonored. He was as faithfully fulfilling his mission while working at his humble trade as when he healed the sick or walked among the storm tossed waves of Galilee, upon the storm tossed waves of Galilee. So in the humblest duties and the lowliest positions of life, we may walk and work with Jesus. The Apostle says, Let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. The businessman may conduct his business in a way that will glorify his master because of his fidelity. If he is a true follower of Christ, he will carry his religion into everything that is done and reveal to men the spirit of Christ. The mechanic may be a diligent and faithful representative of him who toiled in the lowly walks of life among the hills of Galilee. Everyone who names the name of Christ should so work that others, by seeing his good work, may be led to glorify his creator and redeemer. Many have excused themselves from rendering their gifts to the service of Christ because others were possessed of superior endowments and advantages. The opinion has prevailed that only those who are especially talented are required to consecrate their abilities to the service of God. It has come to be understood by many that talents are given only to a certain favored class, to the exclusion of others who, of course, are not called upon to share in the toils or the rewards. But it is not so presented in the parable. When the master of the house called his servants, He gave to every man his work. With a loving spirit, we may perform life's humblest duties as to the Lord. Colossians 3, verse 22. If the love of God is in the heart, it will be manifested in the life. The sweet savor of Christ will surround us, and our influence will elevate and bless. This uh, thought there... Loving spirit, we may perform life's humbling duties as to the Lord. I remember one one job I was doing when I was uh, in the carpet and upholstery cleaning <clears throat> and carrying these heavy hoses up like three, four flights of stairs on my shoulders and being weighed down with them, kind of having a tough day. And I thought it creeped me that I'm doing this for God, to honor, to honor him. And immediately when I had that thought, I straightened up taller, I walked taller, I felt better about doing the task, and and it was a blessing, that job turned out to be quite a blessing. I try to carry that into all of my uh, practical work, thinking, you know, doing the best I can, not just the minimum. Oh, really? We are not to wait for great occasions or to expect extraordinary abilities before you go to work for God. You need not have a thought of what the world will think of you. If your daily life 
<clears throat> is a testimony to the purity and sincerity of your faith, and others are convinced that you desire to benefit them, your efforts will not be wholly lost. <clears throat> the humblest and poorest of the disciples of Jesus can be a blessing to others. They may not realize that they are doing any special good, but by their unconscious influence, they may start waves of blessing that will widen and deepen in the blessed results they may never know until the day of final reward. They do not feel or know that they are doing anything great. They are not required to weary themselves with anxiety about success. They only have to go forward quietly, doing faithfully the work of God's providence, the science, and their life will not be in vain. Their own souls will be growing more and more into the likeness of Christ. They are workers together with God in this life and are thus fitting for the higher work and the unshadowed joy of the life to come. That's, that's an important thought there, too. Sometimes I'll feel like I'm not really doing much, but there's this unconscious influence that, that happens. It's unconscious to me sometimes, you know. But people will later come to me and express appreciation for for something in me, and I'm like, oh, well, that's that's nice nice to say. I wasn't aware of it. And I don't know if I've shared this one before, but it was a recent thing about six months ago, sitting in front of the hospital after having an appointment there, and this lady sits down beside me, and she's sharing that she had just been. She's in hospital because she was a victim of home, a home invasion. And they kept her captive in her home for like a week. And uh, it, was, it, did, it was hard on her. She ended up in the hospital. Then even the police were like questioning her as if she had a part to play in it somehow. Like she knew the people who owed the money or, or, or what. Even even shadowing over her. And so it was really difficult for her. And I just listened, sympathized with her, expressing, you know, that must have been really hard for you, and so on. And then another lady sat down beside me on the other side, and they are kind of talking with each other, and I'm talking with them. And, and uh, not necessarily about God, just, you know, listening and and, and uh, sympathizing with them. And then my ride showed up, and I, I'm walking away. And I'm still in earshot. I can hear them, but they don't know that. They're not saying it to me. And the one lady that was had the home invasion happen, she says to the other lady, she says, that's the kindest man I've ever met. And I heard that, and I'm like, wow. Praise God. Because that's all I really want in life is to uh, to have Jesus in me so much that uh, you know it'll be un even an unconscious influence to others. Whether I'm shopping in Walmart or walking down the street or sitting in a park or engaged in the labors of life, I want I want that uh, special light to shine out from me without effort. Yeah, it just happens. I hope that all. Yeah, I, I'm sure we all want that experience. I'm gonna turn to uh, notebook leaflets. Now, this one will be hard to keep up to me and on because I'm gonna be jumping all over the place. I've such a precious book. This I've got underlining everywhere. It's almost fully underlined. So many nice thoughts in it. I'm going to go to the highlighted ones that I have. Uh, let's see. Let's start out. Let's uh, be of good cheer. Words addressed to the board of directors of the College of Medical Evangelists, Loma Linda, November 9, 1912. Uh, in the section Christian Experience number 14. Be of good cheer. And I'm not going to read every 
paragraph and so on. I just jump to the ones that I have underlined. I feel very thankful that it is our privilege to believe in God and to walk carefully in accordance with the instruction he has given us in his word. If we do this, our hearts will respond to the impressions of the Spirit of God, and we shall follow on to know the Lord, who's going forth as prepared as the morning. At times we shall be in great perplexity and not know just what to do. But at such times it is our privilege to take our Bibles and read the messages he has given us, and then get down on our knees and ask him to help us. Over and over again, he has given evidence that he is a prayer hearing and prayer answering God. He fulfills his promises in far greater measure than we expect to receive. Perplexities. As long as Satan continues to live, we shall have perplexity. And if we choose to follow the counsel of the enemy, we shall have constant difficulty. But if we refuse to yield to satanic influences, choosing rather to lay hold on God and on the promises of his word, we shall be able to help and strengthen and uphold one another. Thus, we shall bring into the word with which, thus we shall bring into the word with which we are connected a spirit of, a, of courage. Never are we to utter a word that would arouse doubt or fear or that would cast a shadow over the minds of others. I am determined not to permit myself to speak discouraging words. And when I hear criticism and complaint or an expression of doubt and fear, I know that he who thus speaks has his eyes turned away from the Savior. I know every such person does not appreciate him who at infinite sacrifice left the royal courts and came down into the world that was lost and lived among the children of men in order that he might speak words of hope and good cheer to the discouraged and desponding. We are not cast about for a possible doubt or imagine someone we may have to stand beneath. We may have to stand beneath the shadow of a cloud that seems to be gathering. We are chosen of God to be his children. We have been bought with an infinite price and we have no occasion for placing the suggestions of the enemy before the assurances of the Lord Jesus Christ. If unbelievers come in and talk their doubts and fears, remember that Satan is not dead. He has agencies through whom he works. But shall we become discouraged because of this? Oh, no. Christ our Savior lives and reigns. Let us not look on the dark side. As soon as we yield to the temptation to do this, we shall have plenty of company. But there is nothing to be gained by looking on the dark side. What we want is courage in the Lord. We want to follow on to know the Lord, that we may know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. This is not going back into darkness. You know how the morning is prepared. If you follow us on, if you follow on to know the Lord every day, you will increase in brightness, in courage, in faith, and the Lord Jesus will be to you a present help in every time of need. Present duty. God sends his Holy Spirit to kindle in the hearts of his followers a desire to open the word to those who sit in darkness, that they may come to the light of the knowledge of God, the final triumph of truth. Ages before his incarnation, Christ distinctly chose his position. He foresaw his life of humiliation, his rejection and crucifixion, his victory over satanic agencies, his victory over death and the grave. He saw the world flooded with light and life and heard the song of triumph sung by the millions rescued from the hold of Satan. And Solomon, when in the capacity of a preacher, when, in the capacity of a preacher, tried to present the strongest motive to holy obedience, the motive that was above all estimate in view of the judgment to come, said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good 
or whether it be evil. Good things can be secret too. God places every action in the scale. What a scene it will be. What impressions will be made regarding the holy character of God and the terrible enormity of sin when the judgment based on the law is carried forward in the presence of all the worlds. Then before the mind of the unrepentant sinner, there will be opened all the sins that he has committed, and he will see and understand the ag aggregate of sin and his own guilt. I think of this when, you know, when I, I reach out to someone and try to share the gospel, the good news, the, the truth of eternal realities, and, and they turn away from me. I think of it. And I actually have a sadness because I know one day they're going to face that moment in time. It's not going to be their only moment. God, God goes, comes to us many times in our life and we're walking apart from him. Christ to reach out to us. But each time a person turns away from that, that, that effort of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Angels trying to enlighten them, it increases the darkness around them. And I think of them. And I, and I say it, you know, just a silent prayer for them as they walk away, hoping that, that they don't have to face that day like that. The trump, But the trumpet is waxing louder and louder, and the wicked dead come forth to confront Christ. When the multitude of the lost, those whom God has favored with great light, to look upon the goodness, mercy, and love of Jesus, when those who might have been saved if they had accepted the light and the blessings of God's word, but who refused to obey his law, see the great sacrifice made in their behalf, they understand the unmeasured love of the Redeemer. They understand his incarnation, the sweat drops of blood, the marks of the nails in his hands and feet, the pierced side, and they ask to be hidden from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They see, as in reality, the condemnation of Christ. They hear the loud cry, Release unto us Barabbas. They hear the question, What shall I do then with Jesus? And the answer, Crucify him. Crucify him. Go to... Uh, Next chapter, Christian experience number 15, good angels more powerful than evil. It is expressly stated that Satan works in the children of disobedience, not merely having access to their minds, but working through their influence, conscious and unconscious, to draw others into the same disobedience. If evil angels have such power over the children of men and their disobedience, how much greater power the good angels have over those who are striving to be obedient. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ, work in obedience unto righteousness, angels of God work in our hearts unto righteousness. The human family have all the help that Christ had in their conflicts with Satan. They need not be overcome. They may be more than conquerors through him who has loved them and given his life for them. We are bought with a price, and what a price. The Son of God in his humanity wrestled with the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that assail men. Temptations to indulge to the indul to indulgence of appetite, to presumptuous venturing where God has not led them, and to the worship of the God of this world, to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. Everyone will be tempted, but the word declares that we shall not be tempted above our ability to bear. We may resent, resent and defeat the wily foe. Every soul has a heaven to win and a hell to shine. And the angelic agencies are ready to come to the help of the tried and tempted soul. He, the son of the infinite God, endured the test and trial in our behalf. The cross of Calvary stands vividly before every soul. 
whom the cases of all are judged, and they are delivered to suffer for their contempt for God and their disregard of his honor in their disobedience, not one will have an excuse. Not one will need to have perished. It was left to their own choice who should be their prince, Christ or Satan. All the help Christ received, every man may, may receive in, a, in the great trial. The cross stands as a pledge that not one need be lost, that abundant help is provided for every soul. We can conquer the satanic agencies, or, or we can join ourselves with the powers that seek to counterwork the work of God in our world. This, uh, this has been my prayer while being, being here with a group of man and women that have been pulled from the fire that nearly destroyed them, nearly destroyed us. God, God, is at work in their lives. They may not know it, but it's certainly the mercy and love of God that's come to them in their life to save them, to save their very life. And, I, and so I pray, you know, and sometimes I'm, I'm praying with one of the guys or something, and I mention them in prayer, asking me, but holy angels of light to come into this place because the devil's a lion. And he's, he's walking up and down these halls, trying to discourage the men, trying to get them to go back out, to give up. Because it's hard work to face our sin, to face a life of, where we've chosen the fascinating pleasures of the world. We've chosen them on purpose. We've made a decision to choose them. And, and then they trap us. They've got us. But those angels, the light, the Holy Spirit, the voice of conscience comes through the cracks of our, our wounds, brings light to us, brings hope again. And, and getting through these doors is the most courageous thing a person can do. And when they come here, I, I pray for them. I pray for this place. You know, that the angels of light will come and push back that darkness from their minds and their hearts so that they can be sensitive to the, the mercy that they're being shown by God and, and receive the healing, the light. And it's made a difference. Man, I can see it happening. And it is, uh, it is my bread and my water. And, uh, Pretty special to be able to see it because we often don't see the results, you know. Just plant the seeds and carry on. The Holy Spirit waters it, take care of it. And I just hope to see, hope to be there to see it. And I probably told this story before about sharing a book in high school with a friend and bumping into him probably five, six years after high school at an evangelistic series. And see him there and I, hey Art, how did you how did you end up here? Here he is. And he says, Remember that book you gave me in high school? Well, a couple of years later I, I thought about being a Christian and the only thing I could remember about how to do that was you give me this book. So I went back to my parents' place and in my old bedroom and I looked around for it and it was there under the bed. <laughs> and I took it out, I read it, and I became a Christian. That was one of those times when I got to see the results of planting a seed. It was unique. We have an advocate pleading in our behalf. The Holy Ghost is continually engaged in beholding our course of action. We need now keen perception that our own practical godliness that by our own practical godliness, the truth may be made to appear truth as it is in Jesus. The angelic agencies are messengers from heaven, actually ascending and descending, keeping earth in constant connection with the heaven above. These angel messengers are observing all our course of action, 
They are ready to help all in their weakness, guarding all from moral and physical danger, according to the providence of God. And wherever souls yield to the softening, subduing influence of the Spirit of God under these angel ministrations, there is joy in heaven. The Lord himself rejoices in saying, Man may and take altogether too much glory to themselves. themselves. It is the work of heavenly agencies cooperating with human agencies according to God's plan that brings the result in the conversion and the sanctification of the human character. We cannot see and could not endure the glory of angelic ministration if their glory was not veiled in condescension to the weakness of our human nature. The blaze of heavenly glory, as seen in the angels of light, would extinguish earthly mortals. Angels are working upon human minds, just as these minds are given to their charge. They bring precious remembrances, fresh before the mind, as they did to the woman about the sepulcher. A created instrumentality is used in heaven's organized plan, the renewing of our nature, working in the children of disobedience, obedience unto God. The guardianship of the heavenly host is granted to all who will work in God's ways and follow his plans. We may be in earnest, contrite prayer. We may in earnest, contrite prayer, call the heavenly helpers to our side. Invisible armies of light and power will work with the humble meek, humble, meek, and lowly one. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Where is that high and holy place? With him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah 57, 15. Pray for each one of us that this can be our experience to engage in that battle meekly and humbly, knowing the weakness of our own characters, trusting only in God to make that different, that we can be a light, a blessing, to those around us in every minute of our life, wherever we find ourselves. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the sound of the rain around me. I'm not sure if everyone can hear it, but I'm outside and sitting under cover in the rain. It reminds me of the drops of heaven, the blessings of the Holy Spirit dropping all around us, touching hearts and minds all around us, pleading with them, wooing them gently, quietly, calling to their hearts. But there is mercy, there is love, there is hope, there is healing for the wounds that this life and this world causes. And too often, they come by decisions and choices that we make foolishly and selfishly. Forgive us Lord, where we make these choices. Forgive us, heal us of them. So that not so much for ourselves to be saved, but so that we can be an instrument in your hand to share that light with others. That is going to be a true joy. The true joy will be to see others in the kingdom because you were able to use us. May we surrender every resistance of our selfish heart, our fallen hearts, our fallen natures. Thank you that you were so faithful that the wounds that you allow are faithful only to bring us nearer to you. Thank you for the Sabbath day. And the rest that it brings. Blessings to all, each one of us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior.